about close up. One thing that most of the candidates for governor do have in common, a little work to do to get to know voters statewide. Certainly in Portsmouth, Steve Marchand might be ahead of the game as the for former mayor. But why does he want the job of governor anyway? Let's find out. Good to see you. Great to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, you're the last, uh, I think you're the last major candidate to declare your intention to run for governor. Why did you decide to get in this? Yeah. Well, look, I've got a great life, my family, my work and all. And I fully anticipated supporting Stephanie Shaheen, who for a long time we thought might get in the race, a longtime friend and I support her. Uh, when she let me know that she wasn't going to get in the race, uh, she and, and soon uh, after others suggested I take a good look at it. Mm -hmm. They knew my background, they knew my passion for issues and, and politics and all. And so I did. I took several weeks, saw the field, uh, and knew what mattered most and jumped in, and, and here we are today. Is there anything about the, the Mark Connollys or Colin Van Austin's of the world that uh, didn't satisfy what you wanted to see in a candidate for governor? Well, certainly I know them both and uh, uh, think well of them as people, but I do think that there were some, there's some clear differences that I thought needed to be highlighted uh, in terms of my experience, in terms of the issues, in terms of, I believe, passionately I'm the most progressive candidate in the race. And, and there are issues off of that that I think need to be highlighted in a state where we have a chance to make a really big difference. So, you know, I looked at uh, somebody like Colin and in the nature of the executive council, he votes with Chris Sununu well, about 99% of the time. I looked at Mark Connolly as somebody who had been a Republican for a good part of his life and good people. But I think that in a state that has become blue and, uh, and you need a really good progressive in the race, and somebody who's been there and made tough decisions, I've done that and, and wanted to get those issues out and believe I can win and be a great governor. Yeah, some would argue the state still has a purple shade to it, but we'll see what happens in November. Uh, Stephanie Sheen, though, so, so you're not getting in this thing if Stephanie Sheen decides to I run. absolutely would have supported Stephanie. Yeah, okay. Well, so what are the issues? Do you, I mean, was there, was there one thing you said, you know what, this is the thing that I can bring something to the table on? I mean, I, I know you, you talked about the, the heroin and the opioid problem uh, during your announcement. Yeah, there are uh, several issues where I think there are big differences between Mark Collin and myself and where I think we, if we want to maintain and improve our quality of life, which is our advantage in New Hampshire, if we want to help people and bring business to New Hampshire, I wasn't hearing enough about it. It is the heroin crisis. Everybody acknowledges that there is a crisis, but that, the easy part is acknowledging there is one. The hard part is getting into the details about what to do. And for months before I was a candidate, uh, or thinking about it even, I was working with my Chamber of Commerce because businesses told me it was a huge economic issue and had gone through and developed uh, a very specific plan, had priced it out, and as a gubernatorial candidate, uh, feel comfortable saying the following, that on that, on K through 12 education, on the way that we fund and do infrastructure in this state, do we have a spending problem? We do in the sense that we can be more efficient in the way that we spend money, but I think I'm the only candidate in the race willing to say what I'm about to say to you. We also have a revenue problem, and we need to be honest about that. It needs to be sustainable revenue. I've come up with specific ideas on how to do that that come from years of experience, and I'm prepared in a state where, look, in a state where, look at Gene Shaheen, John Lynch, Maggie Hassan, and folks that, that weren't governor but have done so much to move the state in the last 40 years. It's Kathy Sullivan, it's Ray Buckley, it's Andrew Valinsky. It's a lot of people in and out of office who've done a lot. People like me, we stand on their shoulders of those kind of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have an obligation to do more when we're standing on their shoulders than simply admire the view. We gotta reach higher. And I think that as a really progressive candidate who's got a little bit of wonk in them and a great passion and a life experience on how to get it done, there are specific places on heroin, on K-12 education, on the way we fund infrastructure, that we can watch the bottom line and do things that we know businesses have told me for years when I directed corporate relations at UNH. They told me were the difference in why they come here, why they grow, why they stay here, and we'll improve the quality of life of our, of our citizens at the same time. You, you, let's go back to the revenue uh, problem. Sure. Talked about. Uh, does that mean you're open to a broad-based task? Ta tax uh, sales income? Now, I oppose, as I've said and I've been consistent sure over the years, you, it's a good question. I oppose an income or sales tax. I oppose the sales tax, the highly regressive tax, I think, uh, and we've seen that in other states. I oppose an income tax uh, in part because it would generate an enormous amount of revenue. I'm not suggesting we need that much new revenue, and we would end up with very high property taxes on top of an income tax. I oppose both on a policy level. However, the business profits tax. That is one, when I worked as director of corporate relations at UNH, this is not a hypothetical or a, a poll driven idea. Sitting down with scores, 100, 150 different businesses, small and large around the state, outside of a political context for several years, listening and asking people in the position to make decisions, what moves the needle? 
I did not hear a lot of people, including self-described conservative, liberal, or apolitical, say if you just cut the business profits tax by six-tenths of a point, man, that would change the game. But it does cost us $33 million a year when fully implemented in revenue on a tax that I don't believe people were asking for that cut. But what they were asking for is the best K-12 through education in the country. We're in the top ten now. I want us in a period of years to be number one in the country on that. They told me that when they are trying to attract a young, skilled employee, into the state to work at their company. The quality of that public school system, that K through 12 system, is the number one driver in how they make that decision. In a state where we're having trouble keep bringing and keeping young people in the state, we're not gonna solve it by having a diminishing number of young people have an increasing number of kids. That's not a policy. The way you're gonna do it in part is by getting talent as we have in the past, successfully into the state, and part of that is how we get businesses to come here is when they know that people 20, 30, 40 something with kids will come to New Hampshire. It starts with education, it's reversing the heroin epidemic, and it's the way that we fund infrastructure, the way we do it now, bipartisan. We used to help towns and cities work together. We don't do it so much now, and in so doing, we jack up property taxes big time, and that's not sustainable either for our residents or our businesses. Specific to the heroin uh, opioid crisis, what would you do that we're not doing already? What, what would you do differently? I mean, what's no, there's good news, and I think this starts with Governor Hassan. Uh, very quickly, this is something that 10 years ago, frankly, we were not talking about in New Hampshire very much. This has crept up on us very quickly, Quick, yeah. and I have great respect for what Governor Hassan and a bipartisan coalition of folks in Concord have been doing to try uh, to address this. So the spirit is there, and in legislation, there's been some good work done already. There are some federal dollars that have come in. In talking to people in law enforcement, and interdiction, talking with people trying to start recovery centers in the 13 different health uh, area zones that we have in the state, uh, talking to people from HHS and in philanthropy and all, people that are recovering. Because of the lack of resources getting on the ground, it's remarkably small amounts of money. When I announced, I asked the reporters that asked me, Steve, your plan's very specific in all the areas, uh, including interdiction and treatment. How are you gonna pay for that? And I asked them, how much do you think it costs? And they would say 50, 100, 200 million dollars a year. But that's you not true. You can't ask reporter questions. I mean, well, we don't know anything. Uh, well, they, they answered though, and it was about, eight, uh, the real answer, it's about eight to 10 million dollars a year. That's not nothing, but targeted the right way at the local level, that can make an enormous difference. It's not because I'm an expert. It's a humbling experience to run for governor because you realize you're only an expert maybe in one or two things. The rest of the time, you have to ask people who are on the ground, who are the experts. And when you do that, and I used to audit cities for a living, that's how we learned. We weren't the experts on day one in a city. We learned by talking to people that were. When you have that kind of attitude and you have that process for solving problems, you can do amazing things. You find out what the price tag is. You identify a reliable way. That's progressive. I think that when you look at the record, we are a state where if you show a record of fiscal responsibility, the Portsmouth Herald union leader editorial pages when I was mayor gave me big time credit for being fiscally responsible. I'm really proud of that. But that also means you have the credibility that when you identify a problem, when you identify a solution by listening and then a price tag and a way to pay for it, there's a credibility you need in order to, to pitch that to your residents. Uh, that's part of the confidence I have in the plan. We only have about two minutes to go, a little less than that, but I want to ask you, what's your take on what we're seeing nationally, this energy that's uh, the, the Donald Trump, or Bernie Sanders, and just uh, the anger that seems to be out there? Well, what's, what's going on? Yeah, look, I'm a lifelong Democrat. My first uh, vote when I turned 18 was for voting for Bill Clinton in the 1992 New Hampshire primary. I'm a Manchester kid here. I'll tell you this, and it relates to my life story a little bit. So I'm a Manchester kid, first-generation American. My folks are newly naturalized citizens. So they are very excited about it on that level. They are deeply frustrated. They, they talked about Donald Trump and they talked about Bernie Sanders and they were looking for somebody who could communicate that frustration of the real world. So I see that firsthand. My dad's a carpenter. My mom worked at the Pandora Mills right down the street from your studio here. And uh, we worked really hard to get into the middle class. French is the, the uh, first language of the house. This is the key and this is why Trump and Sanders, we need to listen to what the voters are telling us, and this is it, is we had a healthcare crisis in, when the recession around 1990. My dad couldn't sell a house he had built. We had to drop the insurance. We had no income, no insurance. My mom has a heart attack, $40,000 mm -hmm. medical bill. We couldn't pay it. They say, you pay it or you file bankruptcy, okay? I only have about 30 seconds. We so. filed bankruptcy. And the reason we did is we didn't have a choice. And there are millions of people in this country, tens of thousands in the state that have it, I know that's why we need things like Medicaid expansion. That's why we need common sense. And I'll tell you what, I don't want any family in New Hampshire to feel the way my family did 
and the way they feel, that kind of stress, explains the phenomenon that we are seeing in this election year. Well, certainly a lot to talk about, and uh, we'll get more into the issues as we get uh, d down the road in this Thank race. You. But thanks for joining us. Best of luck to you moving forward, and we'll have you back real soon. Thank you very much, Josh. Good to see you. All right, we'll be right back with more. Stay with us.